We have been waiting in anticipation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to begin in uh, Psalm 84. How beloved are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. Our soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. Our heart and our flesh cries out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow has found a nest and the sw- sparrow has found a house and the swallow her nest where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in your house. They will be still praising thee. Selah. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are thy ways, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. They all appear before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the house of wickedness, dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Father, we just thank you for a spirit of revelation in this house tonight. That you would open the eyes of our understanding. That we may know what is the hope of your calling with the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. And with the exceeding greatness of your power to us who believe. According to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead. And set him at your own right hand. Far above all principality, power, dominion, might. And every name that is named. Holy Spirit, ask that you would lead us tonight. Take us deeper into the heart of the Father. Amen. Amen. Well, see where he wants to go. I have no clue. Uh, when I was laying in bed this morning about 4 o'clock, 4.30, I was just, I said, uh, I was asking the Lord for my daily bread. And uh, again, speaking some things to me. <clears throat> in regards to repentance. And, and uh, you know, there's Psalm 84 says, who passing through the valley of Baca, which means weeping, make it a well. And it says, the rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. They all appear before God in Zion. That's part of what we have to pass through. Come before him in Zion, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord Zion. It's passing through this valley of Baca of weeping. And the rain also filleth the pools. That, that rain, I believe, is, it talks about in Hosea chapter 10, when there is repentance, true repentance, that it will rain righteousness from heaven. And as this morning, what he was showing me we're in this Laodicean age. We're in this Laodicean age in the church where C. 
See, the problem is there's not true repentance. True repentance leaves where you totally abandon yourself. Totally abandon self-identity. And so this is the Laodicean church. We think we're rich. We have need of nothing. We think we're rich in the Lord. And, and, and he, the Lord comes and says, you're poor, miserable, blind, and naked. This is, you know, they think they're good. The church thinks it's in a good place. They think they're in righteousness and holiness. And he says, buy of me gold refined in the fire. Let me be pure. That's talking about holiness. And white garments. What are white garments? It's righteousness. Mm -hmm. They lost their righteousness. Mm -hmm. And white garments that the shame of your nakedness would not show. See, John, when addressing the religious leaders of his time, of course, John went before the Lord in this spirit of, of, of repentance and turning hearts. And he said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. What is that fruit? It's the fruit of righteousness, which is a totally surrendered life. That is the fruit that John, in John chapter 15, he said, I am the true, Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. What fruit is that? It's It's the fruit of a surrendered life. The Laodicean age is so far removed from a life of total surrender in the church. It's gone. But that is the very foundation of the gospel. It's the very foundation that Jesus laid. You must (laughs) take up your cross. What do you say? Deny yourself. And follow me. That's true repentance at the goodness of God, at his mercy. That's getting a true revelation of his mercy and and totally turning. Because repentance, of course, you know, is meta noia is the Greek. Meta is change, noia, mind, the change of mind. It's a complete turning or your life. But now we say, I'll just say this thing and, you know, you're saved. But you can lose your righteousness. See, righteousness comes as we behold the lamb. The lamb slain from the foundation. That as we behold him and our righteousness becomes of him. But when we behold ourselves outside of him, shame comes upon us. As we behold ourselves outside of that mercy, we have shame. Say that again about two or three times. Yeah. As we behold ourselves outside of Christ, outside of the mercy, this veil of shame comes upon us. It says in in 1 John chapter 2, I believe it's verse 24, he says, Abide in him, He's talking about his mercy. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. He's saying this to believers. (laughs) I mean, folks that think that you can't lose your righteousness, they're sorely mistaken. That's why he says, abide in me. (laughs) And so this is John 15. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. See, the fruit of righteousness that came out of that living out of that mercy, that's the righteousness of God. But we can live in self-righteousness, can't we? 
We think oh, yeah. because of our own goodness. I mean, that, that spirit is it's the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of religion is so prevailing in the church. I mean, every one of us has to fight it. <laughs> it's so prevailing that, you know, when... Who was it that said Jesus, good master or something? He says, there's none good but God. Isn't that... Yeah. That is that perspective or what? Yeah, that's see right. his righteousness is holy of him. This totally surrendered life that recognizes that it's just I'm just this vessel that he flows through. A totally surrendered life who humbled himself, who made himself of no reputation. And what do we, we're defending ourselves, we're getting offended. That's self-righteousness. See, that's beholding ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's beholding ourselves outside of Christ. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. See, what John was in preparing the way of the Lord... (laughs) was people that would surrender their lives and that truth would come in and and they would walk after the Lord. You know, it says in uh, James chapter 3, I believe it's verse 17, it says, the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy, easy, uh, He's to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness. It's this surrendered life. This surrendered life, this fruit of righteousness, is sown in peace of those who make peace. That's a pretty loaded verse there. Yeah. So I, I've been, my heart's been on that for, for a while now. And so as, as he spoke this to me this morning, it is coming clarity. The fruit of righteousness. Okay, so this is speaking of the righteousness which is of him as we abide in his mercy, as we behold him. We behold him, the lamb, not ourself. The fruit of righteousness, it's that surrendered life because we're totally living out of him, out of his righteousness. The fruit of righteousness now is this life, this surrendered life is sown in peace of those who make peace. It's this life sown in To the earth, sown into other lives to bring them into the kingdom. It's a life surrendered to lay down your life to walk in his way. And what was his way? The way of peace. It says he will guide our feet in the way of peace. And what is that? It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's it's bringing people into the kingdom Remember that the kingdom is rec- represented by the plow. It says, no man putting his hand to the plow and looketh back is fit for the kingdom. It's about plowing up hearts, the hardness of our hearts. And that happens as, see, this is why the gospel hasn't moved. This is why the gospel we haven't seen <laughs> because Fruit worthy of repentance is this totally surrendered life. Totally surrendered life. Living out of his mercy. And that life is then sown into peace of them that make peace. Remember the Matthew 5, 9, the son, blessed are the peacemakers for they are the sons. Do you, do you know the word huias in the Greek? You, okay. <clears throat> I'll just do a real quick little thing on that. 
Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, I'll just run through it real quick. It says, Paul, an apostle by, uh, by Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, uh, grace to you and peace from God the Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. That's holiness and righteousness. Those are those two things that the Laodicean church, by me gold refined in the fire, that's holiness, and white garments, there's righteousness. The two things that to stand before him in love. That we were in righteousness and holiness, uh, having predestinated us, before the foundation that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the, the King James says, what, what Bible do you use? NLT. Okay. Um, it probably doesn't read that way, but the King James says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Okay. That word adoption of children is the Greek word huia thesia. That's a compound word of huias, which is sons, mature sons. And thesia is, is to place. So it's sonship. Yes. He's predestinated us unto sonship, mature sons. See, in the, in the culture of that time, the father would place his hand upon his son as he came of age and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Of course, that's the voice that... Christ heard from the Father, right? Heard it twice. That was the huiathesia, this event that the Son would then enter in upon the Father's inheritance and, and take full authority in his business and operate in his name. And so that is our destiny to come to sonship, maturity. It says in in Romans 8 and 19, that the earnest, earnest expectation of creation is waiting for the manifestation or the unveiling of the sons. All of creation is looking expectantly, waiting for the unveiling of the sons. That's the huias, these mature sons. Well, what's a mature son look like? Just like Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus Christ. And that's what's coming. That's the church coming to maturity. The, the Huia sons are going to be the forerunners. They're going to walk just like Christ walked. But they're only those that will totally abandon themselves. You can't, you can't come to that maturity without a totally abandoned life. That actually in Revelation chapter 12 speaks of there's a sign that appears in heaven. Um, a woman clothed with the sun. Okay, so this is a, literally a constellation, a sign that actually appears in heaven. <clears throat> a woman clothed with the sun, which is the constellation Virgo. Clothed with the sun speaks of the light of Christ coming upon her. She has a crown of 12 stars which is, there's actually nine of them are plants and, and three of them are, are stars. Or it's the other way around, I'm sorry. I think nine stars and three plants to make up this crown. Of course, 12 speaks of, you know, governmental perfection, apostolic. And it says, and she's birthing a man-child. And that word man is huias. Okay? It's not talking about a baby. What's being birthed out of Virgo, out of the church as such, is this those that come into maturity into Christ. And it says, who is to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And he's caught up to the throne. So this is the revelation he's bringing us into. He's calling us up to the throne right now to come into that mindset. Of course, we know the scripture says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But we still have to come 
into the knowledge and understanding of that to, to function out of it. We can have the keys in the car and not know that we have it or not walk in our identity and, and never walk in that. And so that's, he's calling us, that's where he's calling those that will hear up to the throne. See, that's what the rapture is. It's, it's, it's living out of the throne room. It's caught up to be one with him. As Jesus said in John chapter 17, he said to his disciples, that where I am, you may also be. He's, ta- he's saying that while he was on the earth, while he was living out of the throne room, where he beheld everything the Father did, he heard everything the Father did. So that's what he's calling us into, this revelation that he's bringing. He's been bringing me into this revelation for seven years regarding the key of David, but it's, it's all about the throne room. And so where was I before I took that big... You were talking about plowing. righteousness, John being a forerunner, plowing, John 15, abide. Right. Well, thanks for that help there. I appreciate that. We're all listening. Maybe I should back up the recorder now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's something when you, the, the James 3, verse 18, that yep. you put in the peacemakers, this Bible says, and peacemakers who sow seed in peace to raise a harvest of righteousness. Mm. But it's sowing a life in this, you know, this surrender. Um, the fruit of righteousness or that which flows out of his mercy. Because our righteousness that's only of him flows out of his mercy. Beholding the lamb. It's nothing, nothing that we do except beholding him. Beholding him and coming to the knowledge of that. By his, as it says in Isaiah 53, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Well, that whole section of scripture, of course, is talking about the cross. So the depth of our revelation of that, I believe there's an increase in righteousness. That there's an imputed righteousness when we confess him with Lord and, and but as we come to, as we behold the Lamb, if we behold the Lamb, and the depth of that revelation, we're beholding ourselves in Him, it's raining righteousness from heaven. And, and we're, just as we increase in sanctification, sanctification is a process, being set apart to Him, sanctify them, by your word, your word is truth. It's a progressive setting ourselves apart to him as, as we put that word on in our hearts. I believe it's the same with righteousness. Because it's obvious that they lost their righteousness. Did it happen like overnight? No. They slowly began to behold themselves more. Behold the Lamb. And so this is what David found through the key of David. David saw the cross a thousand years before it happened in Psalm 82. He he had the vision. He saw it. And he beheld the Lamb. I set the Lord always before my face. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. See back there to Psalm 84, it says, How beloved are your tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even faintest for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. As the sparrow has found a house, and the swallow her nest, where she may lay her young. As they have found a house, what David is saying, Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts! 
my king and my God. He's saying that that is my house, thine altars. David said, I set my prayer before you as incense, the altar of incense, and lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. That's the brazen altar. That's surrendered. That's the surrendered life. Is beholding both places. I set my prayer before you as incense. This is my house. This is David's house. This is the house of David. That the key to the house of David opens. That key, it says, was placed upon Christ's shoulder. In Isaiah 22, 22. And we know that Isaiah 9, 6 says that upon his shoulder, the government is upon his shoulder. So the key of David is the key to God's government. That is the throne room. So, the life of surrender of the Huya sons, those that are being transformed in the image of Christ, is these two altars. The altar of mercy, which is the brazen altar, which represents where Christ, the lamb slain, gave his life, and the altar of incense. It's mercy if you abide in me, in my mercy, and your righteousness is holy of me, and my words abide in you. There's the altar of incense. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. It's beholding ourselves in Christ and it's beholding the glorified Christ in us. We can't come to maturity without seeing him being formed in us. That's the great mystery, right? Mm -hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Mm -hmm. But we have to come into that consciousness. That is the spiritual battle that's going on for the sons. That's the battle. And the enemy knows. He knows that we're enemy number one. Those, the sons are. Because in Revelation chapter 12, it says there is the dragon there ready to devour the man child. He knows. And so that is the spiritual warfare. And it is a war. Like Terry Bennett says, you know, we're, if, if you have any desire to be the son, you don't have time to mess around <laughs> with this world. <laughs> As it says in Jeremiah chapter 17, 12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. We're from the throne room, and that is where Christ restored that back, made it available to go back to there but guess we have to contend for it. It's about a consciousness, and this whole world system, this whole Babylonian system, is all about keeping us from coming into that consciousness. And see, this is what the key of David does. It removes the veils. I'm trying to think how to, not to go so deep, because you haven't been here, but... <clears throat> It's all on YouTube. So. <laughs> See the veils in the tabernacle. There's two veils. So one before the, right after the brazen altar, and one right after the altar of incense. See, they take us through the veils. And those two veils, the first one is shame. The second one is reproach. Those are veils that are upon our hearts to keep the enemy to keep us from coming into our identity in Christ. This is the battle. And Christ showed us the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And there is no other way but this totally abandoned life where there is no good in me that is not from Him flowing through me. There is no good in me. (laughs) We nailed Him to that cross. We turned, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised and we esteemed Him not. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. If we think there's any good in us, that's the danger when you grew up all your life in church like I did. You start to think that maybe there's some goodness in you. (laughs) And Jesus, Jesus said there is none good. Wow. He said that of himself. That everything was from the Father. But that creeps in. That religious spirit creeps in. And creeps in and creeps in. And that's the age we're in. It's not a good place for the church, that's for sure. As Terry Bennett says, there are many going to stand before him and say, I never knew you. And that word know is the Greek word gnosko. I never intimately knew you. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman, or the farmer, the vine dresser. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. I know I've heard this teaching, all that's talking about shaking off and lifting it up. Mm -mm. By the context, there's any way. That beareth not fruit, bear fruit worthy of repentance. What brings repentance? What true repentance comes? What does Romans 2 4 say? It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. And so beholding that mercy. See, this was the great sin of. Chorazin and Bethsaida. And, and where all these great works were done. But they repented not. True repentance. And the amazing thing about you know, we, we expect, we don't, for ourselves, we can say, well, I'll forgive you when you repent. But Jesus does the mercy first, and we're to repent at his goodness. And that's what the sons are to walk in, where we just remit sins. And, by, and as we walk in that and the miraculous breaks forth, people repent at that because they see the goodness of God. Forgiving me even though I'm your enemy. And that's God's mercy. And that's what those that come to maturity will walk in. It doesn't matter who they are. They say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. coming to maturity in Christ, the bride who's joined with him, (laughs) one with him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we remit their sins. Christ is now in us, reconciling the world unto himself. If the fruit of righteousness sown in peace, this surrendered life, where we behold the glorified Christ in us, the one who came to remit sins. That was his sole purpose, to go to the cross, to lay down his life, to be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. His whole life walking, thinking that. 
This is where I'm going. And his whole life is remitting sins. Now we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Christ is in us. And we have to behold ourselves now. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When you're praying for people, you're interceding for people. There is no offense in that place. Christ was never offended. He was there not to condemn, not to judge the world, but to save, that the world through him might be saved. Now the world through us (laughs) is to be saved. But we have to come. (laughs) We've got to behold the Lamb and our righteousness has to be holy of Him. And we have to behold Him in us through our confession of truth. By beholding His words. As John said, in the first epistle of John, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. See, they, they saw the mercy. They saw the mercy. His whole life, of course, was mercy. Which ended at the cross, was, which was the height. But his whole life was a life of mercy. He desires mercy and not sacrifice. That which you have seen and heard. What did they hear? The words. See, this is the mercy and the truth. The key of David. <laughs> The key of David is, it says in Psalm 27, the Lord said to to David, Seek ye my face? And David said, My heart. My heart saith unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. It says in Psalm 89, 14, that mercy and truth go before his face. Mercy and truth are actually the Father's hands, His left hand, His right hand. They go before His face. It's the way to the Father. Through mercy and truth. And it is represented in the two altars. The brazen altar, the altar of incense. It is what Jesus said, If you live in me, in my mercy, and my word lives in you, there's the truth. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Mercy and truth remove the two veils as they're represented in the altars. The brazen altar, his mercy takes us through the first veil, the veil of shame. The righteousness of Christ removes the shame. So us beholding ourselves in him removes the shame. But when we behold ourselves outside of him, there comes shame. altar of incense or the altar of truth removes the veil of reproach. That's where all the way back in the garden, God's word became a reproach to them. They received the word of the enemy. And so they were beholding God outside of the bounds of truth. Outside of goodness. See, the truth of God's word of of his goodness. And of course, that was questioned, right? If he's so, you know, Mm -hmm. he's holding something back from you. So they began to behold him outside of the bounds of truth. 
Thus the veil of reproach comes up. So what removes the veil of reproach? Beginning to behold him within the bounds of truth. Well, Jesus said, I am the truth. My words are the truth. So how do we behold Christ in us? It has to be by his words. There has to be a standard because there is another Jesus. As it talks about in Galatians. People have formulated whoever they want Jesus to be, right? So we must have the truth. (laughs) If you live in me, in my mercy, and my words, that's the Greek word rhema, literally my sayings, live in you, you shall ask what you will. There is mercy and truth. There is Christ being formed in us. By mercy, our old man was placed upon him at the cross. It's the great exchange. He took the old man. He ascended to the right hand of the Father, which is truth. And what did he pour out from there? The spirit of truth. That spirit of truth, which is Christ in us. Now we must behold that as that spirit brings us into revelation of Christ in us. The hope of glory. Which removes the veil of reproach of who we think he is. Well, if we're becoming him, Christ being formed in us, we have to behold the one true God, not what religion tells us he is. And so that which we have seen and heard, the mercy and the truth, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. You were just talking about that, weren't you, Carol, the other couple few weeks ago? Mm-hmm. See, seeing and hearing, it's... <laughs> it's beholding him and it's beholding him in us through the truth, through his words. And no one can tell us anything. We have to experience it, like mm-hmm. as you said, through relationship. Yeah. You know, someone can tell us and they can be speaking something, but there's times where you know, like if someone's speaking under the engine of the Spirit and it hits you, that's God. But if, if someone just tells you you're not... It's got to come by revelation. Exactly. It's got yep. to come by revelation. It has to go into your heart where you start to behold it yourself. Yeah. And, re- and you receive it for yourself and through relationship. Yeah. Because the other one is nothing but a thief and robber because you're going up some other way. Yeah. Devoid of relationship. Yeah. The natural man, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of God, the deep things of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But verse 12 says, but we have received the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that he poured out from the right hand truth, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Sparrow has found a house and the swallow her, ne- her nest where she may lay her young. Thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. That's my house. Thine altars. This is the house of David. Tabernacle. Yes. Amos 9.11. In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Mm. Okay. It's a revelation of abiding in him and him in us through this absolutely surrendered life. I lift my hands. There's surrender before you. That's the evening sacrifice. That's interesting because a lot of people say all these prayer houses, you know, 
house of prayer or whatever. Um, that's raising up the tablet. They, you know, that's one aspect. That yeah. is one aspect. But yeah. it's, as you said, it's in us. Yeah. I think they miss that. They think mm-hmm. if they see it as something outside, but it's yeah. in, mm-hmm. yeah. inside out. Yeah. Oh, not that those places aren't wonderful because they are. Yeah. But I'm just saying it's how we view them, how we see them. Yeah. Who passing through the valley of Baca, valley of weeping, make it a well. As that old man is wholly put away. And his true repentance at the cross. (laughs) As we behold the Lamb. I am crucified. I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. See, that, that, didn't, that was beyond confession for Paul. <laughs> it came to that place. He was beholding Christ in him. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You, you know a lot of scripture. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you quote the whole Bible? Well, not quite. <laughs> I'm a long ways from that, but. <clears throat> um. This is where we are. This Laodicean age, and this is the battle. So I'll I'll kind of go through John 15 again a little bit here. Um, I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in in me that beareth not fruit. See, this is that surrendered life. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. This surrendered life is taken away. And every branch that bears fruit, this surrendered life, he cleanses it that it may bear forth more fruit. Now are you clean through the word I have spoken unto you. As we're beholding him, beholding his word, beholding his word in us. Now are you clean through the word I have spoken unto me. Abide in me as I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Hmm. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he breaketh off, right? How's that go there? I lost my... <laughs> Nobody's John there. 15, John 15. He's expecting Catherine to have a memorized what he doesn't. I thought Catherine was I there following me. She's known him all if when you don't. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he take it. Okay, no. Uh, yeah, throwing it into the fire. That's why I have friends like them. I go, well, where is that? Verse 6. <laughs> I, I get the 15, concepts. Six. You know, I press the verb for right. word into the fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they are burned. Abide in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. This is that totally surrendered life. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide or live in my love. If you keep my commandments, you live in my love. As I have kept my Father's commandments and live in his love. These things have I spoken of unto you, that my joy might abide, abide in you or live in you. King James says continue, but it's the same word for abide. These things I have spoken unto you that my 
joy might abide in you and that your joy might be full. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. That's the commandment. Totally surrendered life for the remittance of sins. Beholding Christ in us. And now we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. When you're laying hands on someone, see his hand. Remitting their sins. What's the difference that I say be healed or your sins be forgiven you? The remitter of sins is in us. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whomsoever sins you remit, they are remitted. He's committed to us this ministry of reconciliation. But we have to be a holy surrendered vessel. Fruit worthy of repentance. Not to cut you off. Yeah. We're actually up to head home. Yeah, no problem. I'm not saying I, I, I like it, but I was only going to come until 8.30. Yeah, but, yeah, no problem. Go to bed early. Yeah. But I love Asha. you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. You want to grab a cookie bar on your way out? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So greater love. Yeah. Yeah. has no man than this than he lay down his life for his friends. Yeah, there's so many things he's bringing right now. A lot of directions I can go, but Father, we ask that you bring acceleration huh? yeah. in our understanding. Mm-hmm. That we may behold ourselves in you, righteousness only of you, holy of you. Mm-hmm. And Christ, that we may behold the glorified Christ in us. Holy surrender to you, Lord. Mm-hmm. Thank you for removing the veil of shame and the veil of reproach. For in this mountain you will destroy the face of the covering, shame, cast over all people, and the veil spread over all nations. You'll swallow up death and victory and wipe away tears from off all faces. And the reproach of your people will you remove from off all the face of the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. And in that day it shall be said, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is our Lord. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain, Zion, the hand is mercy. The hand of the Lord shall rest. Teach us how to walk it out, Lord. That you would bring us into the consciousness of you. 
as Paul prayed that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and unveiling and the knowledge, the awareness of you, (laughs) of you in us, us in you. The eyes of our hearts would be enlightened that we may know what is the hope of our calling, that high calling out of the throne room, a royal priesthood, a kingly priesthood. Hope you're calling in the riches of your glory, the riches of the glory of the inheritance of you in the throne room.